That boy's finally had enough. That the lions don't seem too concerned. And it's... They're kind of urging one another on, almost. And here come the other lioness, so this is great. It's kind of woken them up from their slumber. They're gonna pop into frame shortly. Now, if any of you are watching for the first time, there's some important information that we need to pass on to you. Firstly, that this is happening this very second in Africa. I know it's hard to believe, but it's true. There are some technical wizards who've managed to put a whole lot of components together to get this live feed to you guys around the world. And wherever you may be watching, please let us know if you're watching for the first time. Send us through where you're watching from and to communicate with us and interact with us. It's extremely easy. You either tweet hashtag Safari Live with your question, as well as sending an email to questions at wildearth.tv. Now we tracked these lioness yesterday afternoon on the bushwalk and they crossed out of Juma to the north and evidently they've come back down. Oh, here we go. Look at how cool this is. I don't think it's going to amount to anything too serious. The hippo know, what well, at least I think they know, that leaving the safety and refuge of the water will be risky, but obviously their massive bulk also gives them great confidence, and it looks like we've been extremely lucky because if these lionesses managed to quench their thirst any earlier and start moving off, then we would have had the difficult job of tracking them. And it looks like now they are thinking of heading off and going and looking for a meal. And I'm just scanning around, making sure there are no snacks nearby for them. I can't see any. to Papas in Chicago. And you would like to know a little bit more about these five lioness. Well, they are from a pride called the Inkahuma pride. Right, I think we might need to reposition um, this. I'm um, sorry, uh, Papas, I just want to... Oh, here goes this hippo again. No, just getting comfy. I just want to reposition because the other lioness that ran down into the basin of what used to be the Juma waterhole have started to play a little bit. But it looks like they've stopped. So I think we sadly missed that little bout of running around. So as I was saying, Papas, uh, the Inkahuma pride, they're made up of five lioness at the moment. It's the pride that we see more or have seen over the last year and a bit since we started this safari operation. November 2014. And sadly, they've had a bit of a rough time late last year. A marauding coalition of young males came in and established themselves in this area. And in doing so, oh, here we go, Brian, on the right. A, a calm interaction, but it looked like the one lioness is about to pounce on the other. Oh, I love it when they're in playful moods. And they can be. Incredibly affectionate, Brian. Now the one down in the in the riverbed there. Look at that. It's busy stalking another one. Let's see what happens here. When there's too much action to know where to film, you know we're having a good start to the morning. Uh, well, that one's calmed down now. As I was saying, Papa's again. Sorry that these entertaining lines. Oh, you joking? There we go. Now, what you saw with that hippo, as he flaps his tail like that, he's also defecating. And that's a territorial display. Both that and yawning, opening their mouths very wide to display their teeth, is something hippos will do to try and assert dominance over other hippos. And who knows, maybe they're just getting a bit worked up due to the drought, they're hungry, there's lions right here, and it's all just getting a bit too much for them for this early in the morning. Again, apologies, papas, but basically three lioness from this pride have been lost. There used to be nine of them um, altogether. There was one young male in the pride, called Junior. He hasn't been seen, I think, for about three months. And that's 
A wise move on his behalf. I mean, he may have been killed by the Birmingham Coalition of Five Males, um, but there's nothing to guarantee that. He just simply hasn't been seen. I'm going to reposition again. Um, just to see what this view is like there. So, uh, in the second half of last year, Papa's this lion lost three lioness, and the one male has moved off, so that's why they are down to five now. Is this lioness thinking about jumping on the hippo's back? There's this tail defecating wag that we can see again. Well, Eric Moore, you're right. This is an absolutely epic sighting, and I'm glad you're loving it as much as we all are. One last thing to finish off, Puppers, there's various ages of lioness within this uh, pride. I'm just going to reposition again. Um, we're not entirely sure of their ages, but we're thinking that they range basically from around eight years old to around three, four years old, with one possibly being the youngest, and there's kind of two or three in the middle and then one being the oldest. I guess that doesn't make too much sense. But I don't know the exact dates and ages of all of them. But at least they have come to terms with the big males, the Birmingham boys, and have been seen mating with them. And we can possibly expect some cubs in the future, but who knows exactly when. Now, I've got a VR rig on the front of this of the vehicle here and I just want to try and position the vehicle in the best possible spot in case these lions do start playing which I think they may well so I'm just going to try and no I think this is going to do for now I don't think we're going to get much better than this that in our central spots and like I said this VR or virtual reality rig which is just on the front of the vehicle flashing red there basically films 360 degrees up down everywhere and then once it's all stitched together and cut together, uh, people will be able to watch it and decide where they want to watch. So something quite fun that we're playing with. And if they do start playing, I might switch over into VR narrating mode. So forgive me for that, but it is in the greater good of Safari Live. So that is a possibility. Look at this one. It's using a buffalo pat as its kind of paw rest. Hi there, Marlo, on email. And you are interested to know if it's possible for these lions to get into the camp. And it'll be difficult to, Brian, I'm just going to ask you to maybe show Marlo the, the little fence that surrounds the camp straight in front of us there. Um, various camps in Africa will have a fence like this uh, where you can, on the right, maybe down on the right, I think is your best spot there. Um, Various camps in Africa will have a fence like this, which makes it very difficult for most large animals to get in. Although I have seen Karula slink through this fence with absolute ease, just a little bit further up in that direction we're looking in. But I've yet to hear of lions in the Vuyatilla and Galago camps. Um, but it is something that can happen. And what's interesting, Marlo, is that a lot of camps in Africa will not even have fences around them, or some of them will only have an elephant fence, which is basically and of two meter high poles with two strands of electrified fencing high up off the ground. So everything barring a giraffe and an elephant can make its way through the camp. Um, so yes, it just depends. I've worked at camps in Africa where you can wake up with a lion kill. We've had hippo running through our dining tent one night, smashing the tables and cutlery and crockery because it was being chased by a pride of lion daunting maneuvers to get guests to their camp when there's elephants feeding on the tamarind fruits when I was at a camp in Tanzania. It was actually awesome there because the tamarind fruits would build up in number on top of the, the roof of your tent. They'd kind of be caught there like a perfect platter. Um, the elephants would come and scrape up the fruits off your tent while you were sleeping at night. And what's interesting, one last thing on animals coming into camps is that, of course, 
it uh, creates an element of risk and there have been some people consumed by a lion and leopard when walking back to their rooms uh, if, if they haven't followed instructions to use the night porters or their guides so some people have come unstuck and there are risks out here obviously but the majority of the time especially when animals come into a human area they kind of know that you know they're coming into your space they can smell you they can hear you long before they get there so they're more kind of willing to accept your presence i guess i'm just going to reposition one more time um so yeah i mean if animals do come into camp they're going to be less startled by the sights of a human than if you just stumble across them in the bush where they're not expecting to see you Ladies, it's time to go and get breakfast. Good morning, my pleasure. Morning, David. Hello to Ben. You'd like to know how this hippo would defend itself against the lion. Well, I mean, its sheer size alone is going to give it a, a, a huge advantage over lion, especially lioness. And if that hippo opens its mouth, it can open it incredibly wide, almost 180 degrees. It could fit half the body of this lion into its jaws, and it's got massive, massive teeth. So they will bite the lion, um, I guess is the, the easiest way of putting it. But even if they run with five lion on their back, there's a limit to how much damage the lion can do because they've got incredibly thick skin and I have on many occasions seen lion, lion attempt to hunt hippo unsuccessfully and the hippo run off with barely even a scratch on their hide. And it certainly is possible for lions to take down hippo. Um, lioness will typically take down younger hippo um, because they're not as big. Um, but big male lions can take down hippo. There is the old notorious Mapojo coalition from this area who reigned when I was uh, in the southern Sabi sands. And they were seen hunting hippo on quite a number of occasions successfully. So it is possible, but it's a high risk. But it does happen from time to time. Okay. Interestingly enough, this pride of lion did kill a hippo, a medium-sized hippo. But it was when there was nine of them. Some of you may remember them feeding on it. We didn't see the actual takedown. We just found them after they had made the kill. And that was somewhere up around Buffalsook Dam. Again, we need to be careful. That hippo may have just fallen over and died um, of natural causes or they may have actually successfully brought it down. We will never know the final answer to that. But because it was a younger hippo, it kind of leaves you inclined to think that it was their skill and success that caused them to break, uh, or kill it rather, break it. There's some important news that I have failed to inform you about this morning, so apologies for this, but you will have the splendid opportunity of joining Mr. James Hendry Mr. Mystic Boer and Dave, cameraman on his first bushwalk. So that's exciting stuff for Dave. And like I said, you're going to be going on a bushwalk a little bit later with them. Which is a wonderful to experience, way to experience the bush. There's no ways from the bushwalk you'd be able to get visuals like this with these lions, but you will be able to get even closer to other animals that we wouldn't be able to get you as close to, like the insects, the bugs, the tracks, and obviously there's that thrill and the adrenaline rush of creeping up to some of the more dangerous animals, but typically you're never going to be getting that good a view of them. Oh no, the one lion is just flatulated, and it stinks. Oh, well, very happy to welcome Brian, a new viewer on YouTube, to this live safari experience. And Brian's amazed by the fact that we've got such a little impact on these animals, the vehicle noise, our presence, our voices. And Brian, it is, it is astonishing, but what you need to remember is that 
the Sabi Sands, this reserve that we are in, has been a photographic destination for close on 60 years now. So people have been coming here, never harming the animals with their intentions, only to view, photograph, and move, move out and leave them. So they've become accustomed to that and they don't mind our presence for that exact reasons. We never feed them, we never harm them, and that's why we've become this kind of neutral subject within their lives. And it goes to the same with a lot of the other animals as well. Some of the animals, actually all of the animals, would have required gentle, gentle and slow habituation to get them to this point. If you were to drive into the middle of a remote wilderness in Africa now, and there are still very remote wilderness areas, you will find some lion, leopard, cheetah, elephant, you name it, that will run at the sight of a human. Please don't jump up onto that log. I think she's going to. Should we try and race around? Oh, there's another lioness here that's just got up, and that's the one that she's just locked eyes with. And it looks like we may see a little bit of playtime. That was a great shot there. Watch that. Oh, she's done it. Let's try to sneak up there quickly and get you an incredible low angle view. Get ready to take some screenshots, everyone. This is going to be awesome. How awesome is this? This is a view that I've never been able to share with you guys. Absolutely awesome. The tree climbing lions of Juma. Only kidding. But you do get tree climbing lines of some areas, but they're not very graceful. And even there, you can see that. Here they go right in front of us. Awesome. This is the playful nature we were hoping to see. And who knows, maybe they're getting ready to go hunting. This is awesome. There's still one line is way behind us. And maybe she's going to feel left out and come and join in on the action here. They certainly are not full-bellied. Well, I'd love to have known what the hippos were thinking when they saw that lion there. Ooh, what's this one line, lioness scene? She's locked her eyes onto something. Maybe there's some prey approaching the waterhole. And Kevin and Teresa, you guys are wondering how hungry exactly they are. And yes, they are looking, not starving, but they could certainly, certainly do with a meal. It's a tricky thing with lions. I mean, a lot of people often assume that lions haven't made kills for days because their stomach may not be bulging as it does once they've fed on a buffalo. But they can make small kills that have very little kind of impact on how full they may look to us. Look at how incredible this is, these low angles, these lions playing with one another. It's too good. Too, too good. I think I'm actually going to take some photographs. I should have been from a long time ago. And as I suggested earlier, I suggest you guys should be taking screenshots. And if you don't know how to take a screenshot, Google it and work it out because it's a great way to document your safaris with us. And when there's action unfolding like this, it's certainly worth making the most of. One lioness is up. 
And it'll be wonderful if she comes straight past us for this VR. Close enough. Hi there, Kevin, in Canada, and you'd like to know if I ever get scared of lion or leopard or any of the other predators climbing onto the vehicle and making an easy meal of us. And no, I'm not. Um, interestingly enough, it's, it's something that I've never really felt threatened by. Um, oh, look at this lion here. She's coming straight past us on the left of the vehicle here. And even though she might be a little inquisitive, look at that smear of buffalo dung along her hide. That's not the best look she could have chosen. But I guess um, the reason why I don't feel scared is that, statistically speaking, and I'm one that is happy to work off statistics, the chance of a lion plucking you or a leopard plucking you out of an open vehicle is basically 0.002%. Maybe I'm wrong by a few digits there. But it, considering the amount of vehicles that drive around Africa every day with tourists in open vehicles that never get attacked, it's testament to the fact that with the right behavior and even with the wrong behavior a lot of the time, these animals will avoid us at all costs. There are freak scenarios where very old animals or animals that are tormented or treated badly may attack a vehicle, but like I said, it is few and far between. Okay, I've just seen some potential prey that's making their way towards us, but I don't think uh, anything is going to mount it. It's a manyala, and while these lions are lying out in the open like this, they're not in the most effective position to be hunting. Lucy in Indiana, you would like to know which of the lionesses amber eyes, and she's the one at the back right. You can see, even if you compare her eyes, excuse me, to the one on the left, they look considerably darker. And she's also got a very slight notch in her right ear, which I actually haven't noticed before. And I think she is the one. You see how oh, she's positioned her body into hunting mode. I hope you all notice that. You can see, she, even though the Anyala are like 100 meters away, um, we might show you them quickly. It's, it's interesting how her body language told us that something was up there. And they're just along the fence line. Brian's whipping you across there. So I heard of Inyala. But like I said, I don't think these lion are in a fortunate enough position to catch one. But strange things do happen out here, and maybe they will get lucky. But lying out in the open like this, they're not exactly putting themselves in the best possible spot. Which leads me to say that a lot of people, and this is just my opinion, so it's not fact, but a lot of people give lions and leopards and a lot of wild animals far more credit than they are due, I feel, especially with lions and leopards. They're not nearly as clever as people make them out to be. A lot of people, especially with lions that hunt in prides, say that they've got this kind of telepathic understanding between pride members and they all know what to do and when to do it. But if that was the case, with their speed, with their camouflage, they would catch far more prey than the 20% strike rate that most predators have, or most lion and leopard have. This is a good example, you know, if you're going to lie about and just relax, why don't you do it in a position of ambush, where you all kind of spread out in a bullhorn formation rather than in these random clumps that are not going to lead you to be in a good position of ambush. I mean, especially the fact that there's a water hole here. They know animals are going to come drinking here, so why don't they just completely surround it in order to wait for anything to come and then charge in from all angles? OK, cool. It looks like things have quietened down here for the time being. We'll be sure to rush you back if anything does happen, and we're going to send you over to James to let you know what his plans are for the bushwalk. See you later. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the bushwalk today. We have David on camera this morning. He's on his debut bushwalk. Um, he is, of course, carrying this enormous pack on his back, 
which means that he has suddenly grown four feet. This is a difficulty. Can you imagine having grown suddenly four feet? You wouldn't know how big you were, or how to walk, or how to move. And that is the state in which we find ourselves. Now, David, we're going to walk gently along the road here while I waffle about our plan. My name is James Hendry, by the way, in case you are a new viewer. And our plan this morning is to take you on a little journey of immersion through the wilderness. We're going to try and find some small things, small bits and pieces. We had a tremendous mantis sighting yesterday, very terrifying sighting of a mantis at close range. But we survived, thankfully, due to the skills of uh, Brian on camera and, of course, Steph on security detail. Uh, we are live as the game drive is live, so you may talk to us. Questions at wildearth.tv or uh, on the email, no, I'm sorry, I've lost my mind here. Questions at wildearth.tv on the email or hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. I lost my mind because you can also talk to us on YouTube, of course, on UChat. I don't know how that works. That is beyond my uh, social networking abilities. Um, there was one other thing I wanted to tell you. Our plan for the morning is also to just head down into this little used area here. There are no roads through here and there's a, a network of four drainage lines that lead into the drainage line that ev eventually feeds the pan into which um, the dam flows uh, where you are currently or have been watching the lions with Scott. So that is our general plan for the morning. I think if those, as long as those lions are moving around uh, you're going to spend as much time with them as possible because of course lions like to do absolutely nothing most of the time. So let's head back to Scott while the lions are active. We're going to head through here and we'll catch up with you when we find something interesting to show you. See you just now. Oh, what a beautiful scene this is. Slight pink tinge out to the east there where the sun is attempting to penetrate through this bank of clouds. To be honest, I hope the clouds stay here to keep us cool, to increase whatever slight chance of rain they may be carrying. Oh, yeah, we've got another lioness up here. This is the one with the buffalo poo decoration on her left flank. Oh, the other lioness is going to stalk her and jump on her, so let's be ready for this. The one out at the back there, yay! Oh! Oh, awesome. Oh, awesome. That one got its tail chewed on for a moment. And come on, girls, this is it. This is the spirit we want. We want you to be active, energetic. And even just playing is good entertainment for now. Are these two going to feel left out and join the other three? Good questions just come through from Anna Marie. She's interested to know, I'm just gonna reposition quickly. I think these other lines are a better bit for us, Brian. They're going into stalk mode here. Um, Anna Marie. Oh no, our vehicle won't start. Um, Kirst, let's go across to James quickly and then start this vehicle up in case we need to move quickly. Scott, of course, is struggling to start the car, so this will be a brief cameo of a termite mound. Here we go. And down here, we're looking at a... It is a fungus-growing termite, but not the same termite, as far as I'm aware, that makes those enormous mounds, the famous Macrotermes natalensis. This is something called Odontotermes, as far as I remember. And what they do is very similarly to the big fungus-growing termites. They are also fungus growers, and all termites, or most of the termites out here, grow fungus gardens. There are many ant species that do the same thing in South America, and that's what we call covergent evolution, where a species of animal, or unrelated species of animals, have evolved the same strategy to deal with similar problems. So the reason why they grow fungus, of course, is that they lack the digestive enzymes to deal with lignin and cellulose. Now, this is a kind of termites fare, Delicious. Doesn't that look delicious? Mmm. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to continue the story once the lions have stopped playing. Scott has moved and started the car back to the lions. Oh, 
Okay. So, as you can see, the lioness on the top left of your screen is in stalk mode. And there you can see the anyal in front of her. But this is a perfect example of how... Not clever. I'm not going to call them anything else. But how... I mean... She's stalking through a massive, massive, barren open clearing when they could loop around and even press those Inyala against that fence. There's a lot of cover out to the right there that they could use. They could split up, but only one of them is deciding to really make an effort, and it's a fairly half-hearted one at that. So this is an example of how lions are not as clever as people probably give them credit for. Again, my opinion, you guys can read into it what you like. I'm not sure what that strange noise was from the Juma Waterhole. The, the camera, I don't know if you saw those hippos um, having a bit of an altercation there. There was also some strange audio further to our east. It could have been elephants, though. So vocal morning. And I'm told the zoom is not on the hippo. I don't blame you. So not too sure what it was. But I think those hippos did have a little bit of a grunt at one another. Another noise you may be able to hear is a coming from straight in front of us. It's a very difficult noise to uh, impersonate, so I probably did a ter terrible job, but there is a tree squirrel that's alarming incessantly at these lion. Apologies, Anna-Marie, um, for not finishing off your question immediately, but exciting stuff unfolding here. Are you interested to know, if we were to drive over lion dung, what would other lions' reactions be to it? And uh, firstly, before any other animals react to it, we will be coughing and spluttering. It is one of the worst things you could possibly drive over, I guess, second to a tortoise um, out here. And obviously, it's not because tortoises smell, but it's just terrible to drive over them and you just hear them explode. Um, but elephant dung, uh, lion dung is incredibly stinky, as is leopard dung. Look at her trying to flatten herself to the ground. It looks like the Inyala may smell a bit of a rat here, or smell a cat, rather. And even from that distance, if the wind was blowing there, which it's hard to, it's hard to tell whether it is or not, there's hardly a breath of wind, but if it was, the Inyala would easily be able to smell the lion from, from that distance. Which goes to show why it is actually difficult for these predators to succeed. Their prey has got such good hearing and smell. Apologies, Anna-Marie. What would happen is that the lions would certainly show interest, even buffalo. If you drive over lion dung and then drive into a buffalo herd, the buffalo will even come up and investigate and be like, hey, what's going on here? Why does it smell like lion? You may have seen a blue tinge in the screen there. That was a woodlands kingfisher that flew down and made a kill. Or possibly attempted to make a kill. Here we go. This is going to be a prime exhibit of how not to hunt. Keep watching. Now, I hate to ruin everyone's excitement and anticipation, but it is just the reality behind the fact that this lion has got just about zero chance of catching anything here. I hope it proves me wrong. But, I mean, this is ludicrous. <laughs> Beautiful to see, though. I'd love to know which lioness she is, whether she's a younger one, an older one. I'm guessing she's probably one of the younger, possibly even the youngest. Therefore, the most energetic, the most willing to take a chance, and also the least experienced. The chorus of some yellow-billed hornbills behind us. And the bush is coming alive, slowly but surely. Just going to ask Brian to zoom out quickly, just to show you the other two lioness that she was close to. I mean, they're certainly showing interest, but not a huge deal of interest is being shown. 
But let's see what happens. Maybe, just maybe, if we're lucky, they'll decide to loop around and get into a better spot. I think ideally, though, if we're going to want to see a successful kill during the daylight hours with these ladies, is that we're going to require some buffalo to come onto the scene. I think it would be their most likely easy-ish target for daytime hunting. They're not as quick as the smaller prey. And sometimes can even be a little bit confrontational towards lion, which can get them unstuck. <clears throat> the one thing that could happen here, and this is a good example of how, if lions just thought a little bit more about how they position themselves when they were relaxing, now they spread out quite considerably and they've created a long line, essentially. And as that first lioness decides to surge in, it may chase the prey towards the other lioness in wait through absolute default. Um, it's not looking promising now because they're all in a direct line, basically from behind us to the two lioness you saw earlier to the one you can see now and then the Inyalis. It's not like they've encompassed them, but anything is possible and other prey could come in from other angles. Varietus on YouTube. I don't have my ash bag with me. And now the wind's just picked up slightly. It does feel like it's blowing ever so gently towards us, eh, Brian? Mm. Ever so gently. So yes, Varietus, I mean, I think the lions have got the wind in their favor, so that's one benefit, at least, that they have for now. I've seen these two lions behind us are looking up in another direction so maybe there's some other potential prey coming into this area so again like i said because they fanned out down now in a long way even if other prey arrives and the lioness behind us chase them there's a chance that these other lions could get involved Yes, uh, Rosette and Steph, you are 100% correct. At this stage, the Nyala have got absolutely no idea that the lion are here. If they did, they would have been barking at them. They've got a very dog-like bark as their alarm call, as do their cousins, the bushbuck and the kudu. have got huge, huge distances to cover before they have an inkling of a chance here. But let's see, here we go. This is what we wanted. Finally, one of you is showing some sense. And it looks like even though she's heading in the opposite direction, she is heading in the correct direction to encompass this potential prey. Thank you for giving the lions a little bit of Despite, after all, of my attacking your intelligence, this one now is showing some common sense. Take a wide, wide berth around and try and get onto the other side of these Inyala, hence chasing them towards the lions. And that's our lady. She, maybe she's got her wall paint on. Maybe that's what that was. She knew that she was going to be in in the business, so she thought she would camouflage her coat with some buffalo poop. Well, guys, things have just taken a turn for the better, and I am beginning to bubble with excitement. Even though the chances are still slim, the chances are looking much, much better. Okay, well... Sabrina, you'd like to know a little bit about which lion's which. Nikki's helped me, and I battle to tell who's who, but Nikki apparently says this one here is the oldest. She's got a broken canine. Um, which is the youngest? I'm not entirely sure at this stage. 
um, but there is one that we believe is the youngest. And according to Nikki, and this is interesting, it is apparently the one with the buffalo smear that has just moved around the bush. So again, it just goes to show that you shouldn't believe everything I say because I say the youngest would possibly be the most inexperienced, but in this case, she's showing the most logic out of all of them. Thank you, Nikki, and thank you, Sabrina, just 12 years old, joining us on safari. I'm gonna reposition the vehicle ever so slightly. No, I'm not. Uh, cursed, apologies. We're gonna go back, need to go back to, to James quickly. Just to explain everything to you guys, um, basically the, the broadcast frequency that we send, send out is interfering with this little immobilizer remote. So we cannot start the car um, if it's been running for too long. We're not running for too long. So that's the explanation behind that, and that's why we had to send you across to him earlier, and we are going to send you across to him right now. Sounds like you're having the... So, oh, just careful there, David, we live. Everybody, we have the drag mark. Drag. The Juma, what's all? Okay, so we've got the vehicle back up and running. I've left the lines behind us, and I'm going to try and skirt into a position where if a chase does unfold, possibly we will be lucky enough to see them at least running around for a bit there. Nyala looks to be heading into some thick bush, but I'm hoping the one lioness that's flanking them is going to chase them towards the other line, which, like I said, is just behind us now. We don't want to interfere and help either of the two species here to either escape or succeed. So we just need to try and keep a wide berth and just hope we're in the right place at the right time. The lions, three of them are now moving into this thick bush behind us. It's possible for us to show you now as we drive. The other two are still back close to the waterhole. Basically, what I'm thinking is getting onto the other side of these. Yeah, they're already running towards us. This is interesting. They must have been chased by that other. Look at this. Oh, straight over the fence and into safety. So the other lioness that was the one that was looping around must have chased them. They didn't even let out one bark, which is interesting. And can you see it? Okay, Brian can see it's. It's very thick, but I think you can, there we go, you can see some movements over there. And who knows how they detected her, whether the wind changed, whether they saw her, we will never know. But at least there was that glimmer of hope. The Inyala were clever, they went straight to a safe refuge. The one didn't think too cleverly and didn't back itself being able to jump over that fence. Try to go through it, which I mean, two wires, but at least they all escaped. The lion, on the other hand, unsuccessful. So, no major surprises there that the lions were not successful, but at least we got some great action watching them stalking and walking and there was that little glimmer of hope at the end thanks to the youngest lioness what a surprise uh, i'm just going to go ahead and see if she doesn't keep on moving 
the others are slowly kind of making their way in this direction. But what you may find is they may just plonk themselves down and go back to sleep now. So one line S brown is just through this little gap here. Just to try and keep you in the loop of with who's where and who's doing what. There she goes. So she's just making sure that those in Yala have disappeared, which they certainly have. And we may get lucky and have the other lioness come streaming past us here. Just heard a, a bark from the Inyala now. So now they've obviously regained composure after the initial fright and have locked sights on the line. There's one right in front of us. At least this is slightly better habitat for them to hunt in because it is nice and thick here. They could get lucky ambushing something. Whew. That was close. I was busy playing with my earpiece, trying to get that fixed. Um, and I looked up and the lioness was within a meter of Brian. So one is down there, the other one is stopped directly behind the vehicle. And a third is approaching the one that is just behind Brian now. Just to keep you updated what is happening out of the field of view. And this is Amber Eyes, just to keep everyone in the loop of who's who. She's got those dark eyes, even from a long distance like this, you can see that. Her eyes are a little bit darker than the others. It looks like, is she getting ready to pounce on her friends? Yes, it appears that that's the case. Please, could it happen not behind the bush? Uh, I don't think we're going to be that fortunate. Let's see if we can hustle you into a spot quickly. I fear our attempts may be futile, but worth a shot. Mechanic to have a look at these brakes clearly. <laughs> so three are close to the vehicle now, and there is a fourth approaching from just behind this one where Brian is on. Oh no, sorry, well there's the fourth and the fifth then. So, and they're all reuniting on again. What beautiful, beautiful scenes these are. I think we're going to see a little bit more of affection, possibly some play here. Opposite the toilet break. Oh, claw sharpening here. Yeah. This is going to be great. And, oh, it's... It's all happening here. Now, aren't we lucky to have such active lions today? It's not often that we have them quite this active. And the other two are coming from the left here, Brian. Here they go. Awesome. Absolutely awesome. I think I heard a possible bark of a bush buck there. Give it a second where we are here. We may get a little few more good angles of them. No, I don't think we are. And we've got James with Hyena on foot. You'll be back with us in a moment. This is just so exciting. We popped up the other side of the drainage line. We've popped up quite close to where the den is. And just around here, obviously, these adult hyenas have dragged something here sometime last night. They've been eating it here. And the den is not far, like I say. 
five or six of them got up and sort of ran away. That's what the hyenas do. They will move, and I'm sure the babies, which are just through there in the den site, we're not going to go there, have gone down into the middle of the den. But it's just wonderful to see them on foot and to see how they react to us. And the only reason that one is hanging around there, I can't identify it from here, but the only reason that one is hanging around is because there are the youngsters in the den there, otherwise I think they would all have moved away. So she just wants to see what our intentions are. Right, let's go back to the lions. They're still playing. Well, good to have you all back with us again, and isn't that wonderful? James on foot with hyena, us here with the lion. And they are on the move just exactly how we want them to be. There's a very, very, very fine drizzle mist falling, which is also adding to this wonderful morning, giving us a slight bit of moisture, a slight cooling feel. Now, I'm going to have to work out how we're going to get around you. I think we can follow the fence the whole way around, but it might be a little bit too thick, but we'll make a plan. And what's interesting is that they're heading to another water hole now. The Gallego water hole, which is in front of the Gallego rooms. There's two lodges here, Juma, one called Vuyatela and one called Gallego. Both within the same kind of compound, you could say. But there is a water hole up here, and who knows? This one line is showing interest in something. She's seen something. She's not wanting to play anymore. She's wanting to hunt. What have you seen? Who knows, maybe buffalo are in the area, maybe more smaller prey. But this is really good. Thick bush is exactly that. Ooh, there's more nyala up there. You can just see them moving beyond that one lioness behind you. You may just be able to pick up their tails wagging as they move through. There they go. You may have just seen a blur of movement up there. But I fear that, oh, no. No good. I think there are also some impala in there, but they could run in the wrong direction. And in this thick bush, they may not know where to go. The line are fairly well spread out. There's alarm calls going on. It's not completely over. Even though they've been detected, there is a small chance. It all depends on which way the prey decides to flee. And that is what makes the social lives of lions so beneficial for them. Unlike solitary hunters like leopard, who as soon as their cover is blown, they'll have very little chance of catching their prey. Because lions have got numbers, they can sometimes get lucky. But not looking like that's going to be the case just yet. such a playful mood. This is the most playful I've ever seen them. So if you are joining for the first time, you've come at a good time. I've never seen them playing for this amount of time. Here they go again. And this is just absolutely awesome. All good there, Brian? Oh, no. Shame our VR riggers causing trouble. It can't take the punishment of Africa and all this bouncing around, so it's just switched itself off. But I think we've got some good shots ready, so thank you for bearing with us with that. Oh, one line has just jumped out of that tree. <laughs> it's going to loop around you and try and get ahead of them quickly. All tight. Wap, 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 wap. Yes, Penelope, thank you. You're right, it's wonderful to see them doing something other, sorry, Brian, than being flat cat. I would hate to know the amount of hours of my life I've spent watching big cats asleep and Hence my joy for seeing them so active. And Penelope, we are on the same page. OK, now they've headed into an incredibly thick area where we will not be able to follow them. But fear not, 
we shall loop ahead and wait for them at the Gallagher Waterhole, which is certainly where they are heading to. Who knows, it may be in our fortune that we can't follow them here, and we, by waiting ahead of them, maybe we'll get to see them chasing some prey onto us, which is ideally the angle you want to be on. Let's uh, send you over to James on the bushwalk. I know it's such good fun being on the bushwalk, and it'll be a couple of minutes before they pop out, so we'll catch up with you guys shortly. Welcome back, everyone. And Brian's just busy fixing the VR rig here. Um, <laughs> um, and the interesting news is, is that there's actually a hyena up at the Gallagher waterhole here. It's just lying down. So it looks like Brian's got everything sorted and living on the edge here, hey? Jumping out of the vehicle, you know, there's lions nearby. Brian's got a big smile on his face. But he's got everything up and running, and we're off. Sorry that you guys couldn't enjoy some more time with James on the bushwalk. But I don't think that's a problem because the lions should be popping out shortly. It looks like the hyena's already smelt something, possibly it's seen them, but it's got its head up looking in their direction. I want to get just onto the completely opposite side of the hyena so we can have everything in shot as the lions approach. Just perfect timing. Here we go, Brian. There's one lioness approaching. I would like to get a little bit further. But the lioness has seen this hyena. There's the lioness there poking her head through the bush. And I don't think there's anything too serious for this hyena to worry about. It's not going to be its first encounter with the lion, but lions will try and catch and kill hyena if they get the chance. Oh, shame, this hyena looks like it maybe had a thorn in its foot there, it had a little bit of a limp. But with this much of a, yeah, I think it was just a thorn, with this much of a warning and this much distance between the hyena and the lion, the hyena is going to make an easy escape and it's just now trundled off into the bush as the lion have poked their noses out. So again, I just want to reposition and get us into a good spot for these lions to come and drink. just quenched their thirst, I've got a feeling they're going to come and have another drink. And because we can forecast that, and because this is a very open water hole, I'm going to take a bit of a gamble here and get us nice and close. I'll give them the opportunity to come up. As long as we're stationary here, I think we're going to get you guys some incredible close-ups of these lions drinking. Oh, no ways, Brian. Look directly behind us. There's a buffalo right here, guys. Just lying down, a couple of buffaloes. And I was so focused on the hyena that I didn't see the buffalo. The lion that's approaching from our right can smell them. And that's why she's showing so much intent. Look at her walking with purpose. She hasn't been able to see them yet, but she has definitely caught wind of them. Like I said earlier, the breeze has been gently in our favor the whole morning, and she's going in for a close investigation. What is going to happen here? These buffalo are going to get up with a big fright. There's going to be a lot of crashing branches. You can see, there we go. Or failing that, the buffalo may come and actually chase this lioness, which is, I think, what is going to happen. The four lioness fall to our right have all stopped dead still. I think they've seen the buffalo now, heard the buffalo now. There's the huff and puff of the buffalo. And off it goes, the lioness moving after, not with a huge amount of intent, but it looks like it's just two big old bulls. Now I've seen a third, 
So a bachelor herd of boys in here. I'm just going to reposition quickly. And these big old boys have encountered lions many, many times in their lives and will often actually chase lion. And I think that's what we're going to see happening here. Here we go. Look at this. The buffalo are coming after the lion. And isn't it incredible the respect that these animals command, even from their most likely predator, the lion? OK, well, while the situation kind of is a stalemate, we might as well go and make the most of the scenario that I initially forecasted, and that was for these lions to come and take a drink. I still think we may be able to slowly creep up to them and get some great close-up views of them lapping up this water. Looks like the one lioness that's moving off to the right here isn't interested in drinking, but rather for going for these buffalo. So now what do I do? I think we stay on the line with the buffalo. Hold on, everyone. Because we often see lion drinking, but we don't often see lion being chased around by a buffalo. Let's see if I can't get us into a good spot here. Yeah, this is going to be good. Wow! Look at that! An incredible display of these buffalo's strength, speed, power. Look at all the dust that's kicked up. The rest of the buff are coming in now. And these lines are being showed showed up not the first time that the Inkahuma Pride are going to be taught a lesson by the Cape Buffalo. What a morning, everyone. This is very special. This doesn't happen often. And we all need to be incredibly grateful for these scenes that we are witnessing. An incredible interaction between two of Africa's eternal enemy, em, enemies, the buffalo and the lion. Kristen, you said you didn't realize the toughness of these Cape Buffalo. I'm just going to reposition. We're getting a bit far from the action now. Um, and Kristen, oh, it's phenomenal. I mean, they command so much respect. And like you say, they are so powerful. You saw the way he just came running in there with brute force, kicking up all that dust. Also incredible speed for such a large, powerful animal. now on our left, the line on the right, what is going to happen next? And again, forgive me, I think I'm going to be doing some VR uh, narrating now, which means that Brian might get left behind on the camera. Um, there's one lioness that's on the other side of the buffalo, and even though these buffalo are commanding respect and showing dominance now, that can change, and that's going to change right now. I can't move, I can't move yet, because then... We're not going to see what's happening, but now I have to move. Now I have to move. The lines have turned them. And sorry, Brian. It's such a catch-22. You can't chase after them while the camera's on them. Otherwise, you're not going to see anything. But there was a bush in the way. <laughs> but how awesome was that? And it just shows you how quickly things can change. And lions know this. They know that if buffalo get too ahead of themselves and too bold, there is a chance that they could single one out. And once they've turned them and got them running, they can possibly bring one down. Whew. My heart is racing. I wish I could tell you my heart rate at the moment. And I think the lion may possibly go for another drink now, for lack of better things. No, there's some action coming, Brian. More play. <laughs> well, this is hands down, I think, for me, the most entertaining sighting I've ever had with these lion, and that's with over a year of being here. So, like I said, if those of you, some of you are joining for the first time, you can consider yourself lucky. 
and don't expect this every day, sadly. I mean, I'd love for it to be the case, but the reality is that we do not see this every day. Wilson's just confirming what I've just said to you guys, and they said that they thought that lions only slept, didn't realize they could be so playful. And apologies for taking so long for us to be in the right place at the right time, but they certainly can be great, great entertainment to watch. There goes possibly some more action. Yeah, it looks like that lion is on the far side. It's got too much energy. And I think we, I don't know where we should be now, but it looks like that other lioness on the far left may do some pouncing now to just calm down. But maybe we'll get lucky. No. So good call, Brian. I think you're on the right lioness there. The one drinking so close to us. And maybe if we listen carefully, we'll actually be able to hear her lapping up the water. Okay, well, I'm not sure if you managed to pick it up. I don't think you could. Whew. What fun. What fun it's been. And aren't we so lucky to be allowed so much insights into these animals' lives? Even though it's taken a long time to see this kind of interaction, at least we're getting it now. Hello to Shrub. You would like to know if the lions have got taste buds on their tongue. And I'm 99% certain that they do. Um, but unlike us humans, I don't think they are nearly as fussy as we are. But I'm certain that they do have the ability to taste. And taste is a combination of your taste buds picking up flavors as, as well as your nose, Shrub. And I'm sure all of us can relate to having a cold blocked nose and not being able to taste what we're feeding on, even though we've got taste buds. So um, it's the same for animals and lions have got an incredibly strong sense of smell. So I think their smell does provide a lot of their taste, not only from their, their taste buds. going to try and position ourselves right slap bang in the middle of them, which you ordinarily probably wouldn't do um, if it was not for the VR rig, but I just want to try and make sure we position ourselves in a good spot if these lions do anything else. I'm just going to check if anyone copied my message on the Game Drive channel earlier because no one's responding, which is hard to believe. As stations, the Inkahuma Pride are now at the Gallego Waterhole. Copy that, Abel, no problem. So important just to keep in touch with the other guides in the area. Let them know what's going on. It's a quiet morning out here, though, regarding how many vehicles are driving around. There's just two vehicles from Buffalzook and Ephraim from Cheetah Plains, plus us. So it's four vehicles. Um, they've got more of a traverse area than us, but it's a basically four vehicles traversing probably about 6,000 hectares, which means difficult for everyone to find the animals. That amount of land could easily carry 
eight or nine vehicles without it being overcrowded. And also that way you'd more effectively all be able to search the different areas. So it's very important that we do share information with one another. Here are the other three. Also in a similar fr frame of mind to the two. Taking it easy. Good, well, finally, this looks like the Lions have given you guys an opportunity to go on a bushwalk with James as they've calmed down. So I hope you guys enjoy it, and we will see you back in a little while. Right, over. it should be okay for now. Hello, everybody. We're just uh, doing a little bit of deciding how the backpack should be. I think you've got a picture. David is lancing this aerial straight towards the receiver, so we should be okay. Right, you have had a quite astonishing morning. When I heard that there were lions at the pan, I almost thought to myself, well, maybe we should take the Mahindra and go in the car there. And then I thought, no, no, they'll be asleep within five minutes and it'll be a total waste of time. Well, it doesn't seem to have been a waste of time at all. It sounds like it's been magnificent. Well, while you've been chasing lions and buffalo around, we found a flower that is being attacked by ants. And it is a morning glory flower, which is a very uh, common flower around here. And there he is. And around him, of course, are a whole lot of ants. Now, there are hundreds of thousands of species of ant around the world. And I suspect that these ones here, unlike many, are not carnivorous. I think they're probably looking for bits of nectar that might be coming out of the plant. Now, what I'm going to do is just turn it slowly towards you. You see that, David? Does that work for you? And we'll just get a bit of an idea there. And what I want you to try and picture is those ramps. Now, there are ramps of very deep purple, which will give off ultraviolet light, which only insects can see, and it will attract them like sort of um, ultraviolet runways almost, and the insects will be enticed into the middle of the flower. They'll be covered in pollen, they'll go off, and they'll find other flowers and pollinate them. And that's how it all works. It's really rather clever, I think. Then the other thing I found here, while I was lying on the ground, prostrate, is this strange egg sac. See that, David? Now, I don't know what's in that thing, but I can see through its slightly translucent covering that there seem to be eggs inside it. It might be a mantis uthica. We spoke about mantises earlier, and mantises lay their eggs in something like this called an uthica. But to me, it looks a bit plasticky to be an uthica, but I don't want to break it open simply because I think that that will kill, obviously, whatever is trying to become born deep within. So that's what's going on here. Now, if I might finish my previous discussion before the lions get up and start doing astonishing things yet again, the one thing I just wanted to show you. So we're in the middle of a drought, of course, and lots of the termites and things will need to are, are actually surviving fine because they're eating dry wood and dry grass like this. Now, the ability of them to do this, of course, is allowed by the fact that they grow fungus gardens. And those gardens grow the enzymes that they need in order to digest this stuff. Very few organisms in the world possess the enzymes to digest lignin and cellulose, which is the structural material in plants. It's why you can't survive entirely on plants. And it's why cows and horses and other animals like that are covered or filled with bacteria that help them to digest this sort of food. Let's go back to the lions with Scott and um, I will see you just now and I will try and avoid being um, uh, murdered by this, uh, by this uh, aerial here. See you shortly. Well, against all odds, the lions are moving again. And they're moving into a very thick area which is going to make our lives difficult. Uh, unless, of course, they decide to head to the hyena den, which is looking possible at the moment. This is Amber Eyes coming past us first. And she's going to move right past the side of the vehicle. Awesome stuff. And who knows, maybe they're going to follow the scent trail of the hyena that have moved backwards and forwards along these pathways. The 
den is in the direction that these lions are heading in. And wouldn't that be interesting to see a little bit of interaction of these lions creating chaos at the den? I just creep a little bit forward. It's a very tricky area to follow animals through this. Thankfully, though, for the hyena, it looks like the lion have veered slightly away from their den site now. But again, moving through an area that's incredibly difficult for us to maneuver through. Well, these girls mean business this morning, and who knows what is going to happen and when. But again, we must just be incredibly grateful to be with these lions on the move, basically a part of their pride. I'm glad I wasn't a part of their pride when those buffalo were chasing them around. That must have been terrifying. I could think of nothing worse than being chased down by one of those big boys. Somewhere just up off to our right there. Not sure exactly where, but not too far away from us. But like I said, for now, I think the hyena are safe. Just going to update Abel quickly as to their position. Abel, let me know when you get closer by, but at the moment they're heading kind of north and west into that thick block away from the Gallagher waterhole. At this stage, they've just lay up, so if you um, go past the Gallagher waterhole towards Mvubu Road, um, I'll call you in from there, I'll get your audio. Thank you, Scott. Well, it looks like, finally, let me see if I can roll back a tiny bit. No, we're stuck where we are here. Um, looks like finally these lions have decided to have a little bit of a rest, but it's not uncommon for a lion to, to act like this. They move a little bit, sleep a little bit, move a little bit, sleep a little bit. When, of course, that will come to halt until a full sleep. Only time will tell. Hello to Wicked Blues Band, and you're interested to know if these lions would be as active as they have been if they were not as hungry as they are. And certainly not. I think it's unlikely for them to exert any extra energy when they are uncomfortably full. So I think that has been in our benefit. But I mean, even looking at their stomachs now, they, they're not starving. They're just not completely stuffed like they've come out of a buffet, a buffalo buffet, a buffalo A. Um, so they're kind of content, you could say. It's not like they're emaciated and dying for a meal, but not that kind of perfect happy medium at the moment. But it certainly does contribute to the activity that we've been seeing. That coupled with the coolness I think that, coupled with the fact that they had to wait for an hour and a half to have a drink, 
after those hippos initially chased them off. I'm not sure how or what caused the scenario to change from quarter to four or quarter past four in the morning when they initially attempted to drink, uh, opposed to when we saw them having a successful drink without too much concern from the hippopotamus. It's kind of a blessing in disguise almost that they have stopped moving here. Um, because like I said, if they continue through this area, I mean, depending which pathway they take, there, there may be a slight chance we could follow them, but there's a strong likelihood that we would have to try and leave them and loop ahead and just guess where they may pop out. Well, good news, James has found an interesting arachnid for you guys. So from a voracious terrestrial predator to a voracious web-bound predator, this is the garden orb web spider. And some magnificent colors on him, or no, her, definitely. This is a lady. And she's got obviously beautiful yellow and maroon, a bit of black and white, and a little bit of orange on her fairly intimidating looking pedipalps. Those are the things in front of her face there. Now, she is living on a web here, and there are not many garden orb web spiders around, as there are not many golden orb web spiders around, and that's because there aren't many insects around, and there aren't many insects around, of course, because there is very little in the way of water around. And without the rain, the insects don't seem to come. There's plenty in the way of heat. Insects do like heat. In fact, there's this, an overabundance of heat, I would say, but for the last two days. Now, the interesting thing about this web is that it is, of course, in, intricate and brilliant in its construction. But they have this little thing here called the stabilimentum. And one of the theories as to why they have those things there, because, of course, there are many orb web spiders that don't have them, so they're not necessarily there for structural rigidity, but perhaps to stop birds flying through the web. So obviously the silk of the web is almost invisible, especially if you happen to be, say, a woodland kingfisher bent on trying to find a girl, and you're flying at Mach 3 or so, and I mean it would be very easy to go straight through this thing and completely destroy the web. But because of those stabilimenta there, I think the web is pretty obvious to birds, and so I think that's the best theory, personally, for why they have them. There are some other theories that it helps give it structural rigidity, which I suppose it might, but I'm not sure that that's what it's for. Now, what I want you to try and do, David, if you don't mind, if you can try and super tap in here. There is, at the back of the spider, an opening, and that opening contains the spinnerets, or the organs, from which the silk emanates. You see it there? Okay. It's just a bit at the back there, on the bottom. Now, Kristen, while David tries to find the spinneret, you want to know how I know this could possibly be a female. That's it. It's the maroon bit right at the back there. Kristen, it's a female because it's so big. The males are much, much smaller and are often devoured by their consorts post-mating. Of course, this is a habit of a number of invertebrate species. The mantises do the same thing. Um, I know some human beings who would do the same if it wasn't illegal, but of course that is a matter for another discussion entirely. Then, David, once you've done that, there's another very, very impressive web here. But who the owner is, I don't know. I'm not even sure we're going to be able to film this. Very, very intricate web that has been spun here, also of an orb web spider. 
Now, of course, as I said yesterday, to say that this is an orb web spider is a little bit like saying that something is a mammal, for example. I mean, there are so many hundreds and of, of probably thousands of orb web spiders. There are hundreds of different species, or, or not hundreds, but there's certainly tens of species of golden orb web spider. So it really is, we know so little. We know everything about the mammals, or many things about the mammals. We'd never go up to an antelope species and say, well, oh, that's an antelope. We know what species it is. Then we know how it behaves, and we know just about everything about its biology. This garden orb web spider is probably uh, one of ten different kinds of garden or web spiders that you would find. All of them have their own unique niche that they fit into and we just don't know that much about them. Beautiful, hey. All right, let's carry on. Now, of course, when we see spiders, the arachnophobes start to ask us questions and those who are just interested in arachnids, of course, we're going to go back around this mound so that we don't knock it over. No, I mean, not knock the mound over, knock the, the web over. Jeepers Creepers, your question, that's a wonderful Twitter handle. You want to know about venomous spiders and how many we have here in South Africa. Jeepers Creepers, we have probably got two medically significant spiders out here, maybe three three medically significant um, groups of spiders, one of course being the button spiders, the black widow, the famous black widow spider known um, to have a neurotoxic venom. Then we've got something called a crab spider which you will find on various plants and they can create a cytotoxic venom site so they'll bite you and your flesh will rot and then you get the violin spider which I think has a very similar effect to the crab spider. So probably three medically significant ones. Um, none of them, of course, will cause death within seconds. And that, of course, is the great fear of many people who don't like spiders. They think that a black widow spider, if you get bitten by that, your death is imminent. It actually probably wouldn't kill a healthy adult human being. It probably, you know, it might kill an old person or a child if in the absence of medical treatment. But otherwise, you know, we don't really have a great swathe of dangerous um, arachnids. Darbert, come through here. There we go. Watch your aerial. <laughs> it's like I said, it's like growing another four feet and suddenly having to learn how to do it. Hmm. Now, Jeffrey in Texas You've got an orb web spider in Texas called a zipper spider, which sounds like an interesting thing. And your comment is completely valid. You say that the drought is providing us with the opportunity to see all these things and how they cope and how they, many of the animals here are adapted for arid environments and are able to cope with A, the heat, and B, the drought. So the heat is one thing, but of course the drought is entirely another. And just so that, just to give you an idea, David, if you were to sort of just, I don't know, pan along or tilt along, whatever you call it, along the ground here. At this time of the year, just don't lean over too much. At this time of year, this kind of ground would normally be covered in a long sword of various grass species. Uh, they'd probably be covered in moisture after a dewy night or perhaps even a bit of rain. And we were watching a little piece of Brent Leo Smith's first drive which he did almost exactly a year ago. And he was driving on the road down towards the pan where you watched the lions this morning. That whole clearing was in, inundated with grass that tall. So quite astonishing. I mean, that's a, that's a good two and a half to three feet. Really amazing stuff. And now you can see not much going on at all. So when you first joined us, we were on our way through the drainage system that I think the lions are in now and we were heading towards the noise of some hyenas. It turned out that those hyenas were at the den. We had a wonderful sighting of three or four adults before we sort of turned around and moved away because we got to within maybe 60 meters of the den or so. That wouldn't have had any effect, negative effect on them. Hyenas have an amazing strategy for dealing with intruders at their dens. They don't engage in conflict at all, normally. The babies just disappear inside. They've got specialized shelves on which they lie, and so very few predators could actually get in there and fetch them out, unless it was perhaps a, 
I mean, I suppose something like a badger or perhaps a really big snake could get in there and take them out, but otherwise they'd be totally safe from lions and leopards and indeed other hyenas. The adults will just scarper away and that's precisely what happened. So that was quite fun. And then we turned north and we're now heading toward the Buffelshoek cut line to the north and we're just going to see what little things that we can find along the way. I have to stop to answer this question from Dylan in Iowa. Dylan, you say, is it true that when you come on a little bushwalk like this, you are told to bring an umbrella, and not indeed for the rain, but in case you should happen upon a lion, then you would open the umbrella and uh, it would uh, in some way make the lion think you were a porcupine and then deter the lion from attacking you. Dylan, whoever told you that is either an imbecile or a clown. Uh, that is no, no, that is definitely not the case. You do not bring umbrellas on walks with you to deter lions. You might take an umbrella on the walk if you wanted to deter the rain from hitting you, but lions, no, not so much. Remember that we are on a walk here because it is safe to be on a walk. Yes, we are careful. We are looking constantly around the place. That's why Steph's here while I'm talking away. My ears and eyes are not properly in the bush, so Steph is constantly looking around the place. And it's safe, though, to be here because the animals out here see us as predators. They are generally afraid of us, and that means that if we are respectful and keep a safe distance, then it's completely safe for us to be out here. Now, that is why we don't need to worry too much about having extensive amounts of defensive equipment with us, especially umbrellas, to deter the lions. Now, what I can hear through there, this is one of the most important things that we have for our defense, of course, is our ears. What I can hear through there is some oxpeckers going, psh, 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 psh. Now, oxpeckers will alarm call at human beings. And, oh, gee whiz, okay. And those termites, those, um, I'm now very excited because we've got an astonishing array of termites here. This is amazing. So, just have a look here. And Steph will go and look what, it, what those ox pickers are sitting on. Look at these termites. Look at this. There's a great swathe of them here. Now, these look like macrotermies to me. They look like um, the standard issue macrotermies natalensis. And they're out on a foraging party. But what I want you to do, these are all soldiers. They've obviously been engaged in a pitch battle. Most of them are soldiers. You can see their pincers on the top of their heads. That makes them soldiers. The workers have no pincers, so there are a few workers. In fact, oh, here we go. Can you get in, on, get in here, David? Here are the workers chopping off bits of this grass stalk here, and they're carrying it in down this hole. Now, this must make them harvest a termite, but they look just like macrotermies, so I really don't know exactly what, yes, I do. The mound is just behind us. Yeah, that's the mound there. They'll be taking this stuff down into a tunnel that will lead underneath this termite mound. So they are macrotermies, they are fungus-growing termites. Okay, so let's get back in here. They are cutting down all this dead grass. If this was green, they probably wouldn't be cutting it down. And they're also now, some of them, panicking a bit as the day comes and they perceive us as a predator. And all the little ones, all the workers are running back into the holes and you can see them being protected and shielded by the soldiers there. Isn't that amazing? It's just incredible. The other thing I'd like you to try and notice, David, I don't know if you can get a close-up on them, but when they, every time they pass each other, they greet, and they exchange a little bit of saliva. Now, what that means is that because they're all greeting each other all the time, everybody carries a certain ratio of soldier to worker saliva in their mouths. 
Now eventually somebody way under the ground, under that mound that I showed you, is going to feed the queen. And that ratio of saliva in the feeding worker will tell the queen what she should be laying. So the ratio of saliva will signal to the queen, does she need to lay more soldier eggs, does she need to lay more allate eggs, or does she need to lay more worker eggs, which I just find absolutely astonishing. And insomnia, you say that you love ants because they're so clever. I also love ants because they're so clever. These, of course, are not ants at all. Remember, these are termites. They're actually much more closely related to cockroaches than they are to ants. Now, what I want you, we're going to do one more thing before we link back to Scott. Watch, just watch them shake their heads against the floor as I move my hand over them. So, re ready? No, they're not doing it. Let me just tap the ground here. There. Did you see that? We did again. Isn't that amazing? Cool. All righty. I think let's head back to Scott. I'm not sure what he, I think he's still with the lions. Let's head back to him. We're gonna continue our little passage to the north. Amazing stuff. Apologies, the earpiece is probably the weakest link in our technical list of things that can go wrong, and I uh, have got no comms with the final control room. But Brian thankfully indicated that we are live. As you can tell, we were just sitting here peacefully falling asleep alongside these lion. So before we do fall asleep, I think we should head off and see what else is happening on Juma. We've had such a wonderful morning with these animals. And as you can see, it doesn't look like a whole bunch is gonna change. Of course, anything could happen when we drive off, but that's a risk I'm willing to take to go and see what else has happened on Juma in order to kind of lay a good foundation for the sunset safari. If we know where tracks of leopard are, where the other animals are moving, we, we've got a better idea of what's going on on the property and it's good to try and keep track on things. And because there are so few vehicles driving around today, only one from, from Wild Earth and hardly any others traversing Juma other than Abel who popped in here, um, I think it'll be most effective for us to move off. Now, I've been jiggling my earpiece, but if Kirsty can continually speak for me, that would be useful to know if it is actually gonna work. Okay, I'm getting a little bit from you, Kirst, but it's very soft. There we go, that's better. Hello, Kirsty. Wonderful, I can hear you. Okay, well, now that I do have comms with Kirst again, that's good news, but I'm sure all of you are in agreement. We've had a wonderful morning with them. They're fast asleep now. Four are here. The other one is just down to our right. It's very thick there, but Brian will be able to work his magic to get you a glimpse of her. Not good prospects here anymore, I don't think. So, off we go. What a morning it has been. Thank you, ladies. The best performance yet for me. The only one that I think probably uh, beats this is a sighting that I only caught the end of, and that was the sighting I spoke about earlier this morning when Brent was lucky enough to see this pride take down an adult Cape Buffalo in an open area. The footage is incredible, and it was such a cool thing that actually happened. I was sitting at Twin Dams, just listening carefully for any audio. I can't remember what I was hoping to find, but I was just sitting patiently, listening, and uh, Brent was live, and the director, I can't remember who it was at the time, let me know that the lions were stalking something. They don't know what it was. Um, and I think it was Nikki who was directing. Um, and they weren't sure what the lions were stalking, but the lions were in stalk mode. And that was the last update I got until I heard which is the sound of a buffalo that is busy getting taken down by a lion. It's their distress call. And 
Um, I wish you could have been on my vehicle to see our, um, myself uh, start the car up, drop the clutch, and start tearing in that direction where Brent was. He wasn't too far away uh, from where we were. Probably, as the crow flies, three quarters of a mile, but it would have probably taken us about a mile and a half to get there. And we managed to get there just in time to see the lions literally collapse the buffalo. We got there just for that final kutunk as it hit the ground. And then they still needed to kill it. And it's not an easy job killing an adult buffalo. So that took quite some time. So it was quite nice to have two vehicles there cutting between the different angles. Uh, incredible, incredible sighting. The best kill by a long shot um, that we've ever captured on film. Um, the best of the four or five that we've we've captured. Maybe maybe a few more than that, but not many. I don't think we've hit double digits with kills. And again, statistically, that means we are seeing we probably yeah, I mean we're probably seeing a kill every three months if we're lucky at this stage. But what I keep telling everyone is that hopefully we are building up credits. And who knows, maybe one week we'll just see a kill every day. Boom, 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 boom for a week. And then be in debt again. But I certainly think that we have been building up credit regarding kills as well as cubs. Not much cub activity. to Bill. He's watching in Tennessee and I'm told you are new to the safari experience. And Bill, because you're new, it's important that you don't get alarmed when the road simply disappears in front of you thanks to a tree being pushed down in front of it. That's thanks to the elephants. And Bill, it's wonderful to have you with us. And you would like to know, have Lion ever been uh, successful in killing a buffalo that has tried to attack and tried to stand up for itself and yes definitely just like we saw this morning bill even though buffalo can and will very often especially the buffalo bulls actually confront lion um there are turning points like we saw this morning and at one point the lions were dominant and those buffalo were running for their lives in a cloud of dust um, and in those scenarios, if just one buffalo just lags back a little bit, the lion can get onto it, pull it down, other lion can keep the other ones at bay. So, I mean, there's just a million variables of what can happen. But certainly there's many scenarios where lions even would have been maimed and injured, possibly fatally injured, by a buffalo that they're busy hunting. But yet still, the lions will win and kill the buffalo. And there have even been other scenarios where the lion, the buffalo will win outright and kill one lion or maybe kill the only desperate lion that's trying to, to catch and kill them. There was an incredible sequence of photographs um, that I saw quite recently. I mean, when they were, were taken, I'm not sure, but it was of an old, old male lion. He was on his last legs. He was thin. He was desperate. He was weak. Uh, 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 an impala probably could have warded it off. But he tried to go for this big cape buffalo. And the buffalo, as we saw earlier, just decided to stand its ground. And this feud continued. I think it was also a very old buffalo. So it was like this kind of perfect match between two animals that were on their last legs. But the buffalo ended up winning and it ended up killing this one male lion. But it was backwards, forwards, this brutal battle that actually went on for so long that they'd just be lying down watching one another until one finally got enough energy to make a bit of an attack and then the other one would make a bit of an attack, but the buffalo ended up winning. So there's always an exception to the rule out here, I guess, and there's always kind of a roles reversed. Not always, but there's always option, opportunities for these interesting things to happen. An example of which, um, off the topic completely, but still relevant uh, in terms of that anything can happen out here and that there are exceptions to the rule, is that, and it's a question that's been asked quite often, why will we not see the lion and leopard immersing themselves in the water to cool down in this hot weather? And 
Um, I said categorically the other day that lion and leopard will not go into water unless they are forced to, unless they need to cross the river, unless they really have to do it, but they certainly will not be, do, be seen doing it just to cool off. But then James showed me a photograph of a leopard actually here in the Sabi Sands, the southern Sabi Sands in the western section. It was a male that was apparently renowned for going into deep pools of water to cool down. And I saw a picture of it, James showed me, when the leopard is in this deep pool with just its head sticking out. I think it must have actually been sitting, not even lying down in a shadow puddle. So there we go. I mean, bizarre things do happen out here. But a very fine misty drizzle falling on us again. It is so refreshing. Oh, sadly not going to do much for the drought that we're experiencing, but any tiny little bit of moisture, I guess, is better than nothing. But I don't think you'll even else it. Maybe, I don't know, Brian, if you can maybe even, there's a bit of a sheen. So you may be able to see a few little drops falling, uh, yeah, even on the lens. name is and you would like to know anyway. sorry I'm not copying your name clearly but one of you a new viewer would like to know will the buffaloes poo uh, uh, mask the sense of the lions to help it hunt better uh, no um, I think it'll just be a cocktail of, of smells but the lion smell will certainly be able to be picked up by, by, by the prey. Sorry, I just can't seem to work out what your name is, but it's something Dakota, and it's great to have you with us. Ian, Ian Dakota, apologies. The earpiece apology, uh, uh, together with my terrible hearing is making it a little bit difficult to work out who you were, but great to have you with us. There's some Franklin back here, and it could just be that they're having a dispute amongst themselves, but they seem a little bit too worked up for my liking, so let's go back and have a look. Who knows, maybe we'll find a leopard here. Woodlands kingfishers are calling ballistically, Chick -brr! but we can't read too much into that regarding a predator. Just their general banter. There's somewhere down into this riverbed to our right that they started calling out quite loud, quite loudly from. So let's just go onto the dam wall where we're gonna have a, a good view down into that area. Maybe Karula, the queen of Juma, is coming for a drink. And for those of you who have yet to meet Karula, she is the female leopard who reigns dominance over the majority of Juma. Her daughter does come onto Juma as well, but we don't see her as much in this area, or at all really in this area. Well, things that the Franklin could have been alarming at are not only leopard, but birds of prey, snakes, mongooses. There's a long list of possibilities. This is quite a nice vantage point up here, as I'm sure a lot of you have realized, to look down into this riverbed where the alarm calls came from. That's the Woodlands Kingfishers, they're going absolutely bananas. I'm hoping we're going to be able to try and find one for you. I can't see them, though. And I'm, if we get lucky, we'll be able to see one fly and land. And what they do, and I've yet to be able to show you this, is they hold their wings up to display their incredible turquoise coloration. Hopefully one's going to fly and land in this dead tree that Brian's on now. It sounds like they're in this tree over here somewhere, but where exactly? It is not easy to see. It's not the biggest of birds. They've got a bigger voice than body. But 
That was a woodpecker. There's another bird, and I can't work out what it is going tick, 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 tick. It's one that I should know, though. Could be a red backed shrike, I think, making that noise. And who knows what's got the bird so vocal here, but it doesn't appear to be a predator at the outset. So let's continue. I'm keen to try and cover a little bit of ground and check the roads just to see if we can't find any tracks of anything exciting that we should know about for the afternoon. Like I said, we got such a good morning. Let's try and lay a good foundation for the sunset safari. And while we do that, we're going to send you back to James on the bushwalk. Now we have found a voracious predator of herb. There is a tiny little grasshopper. Can you see him? He is just about half the width of my, or half the length as my little baby nail. Look how tiny he is. And he's facing you back, or he's facing the opposite way to the one you're looking. Those are his great big legs that allow him to hop high into the air to escape predators. Isn't he amazing? I'm just going to try and, sorry David, I'm probably messing with your focus here. Let me try and just open, oh, here he is, there. Now you'll get his face perfectly. You see him there? There he is. You might even be able to see his tiny pinprick little eye, his tiny little feelers, which are like two small black Sort of hairs almost on the top of his head. He looks, he, he looks very serious. Let me see him. You got him. He's a very serious fellow indeed. And he's sitting on a plant called the Bushman's grape, or Cissus cornifolia. Very aromatic plant. There now you can see his eyes. And Cissus cornifolia makes a fruit that Brian described as tasting like a roast chicken dinner with the apple crumble at the same time, which I thought was a very effective descriptor. Now, that was the grasshopper, which is not the original reason we stopped here. We originally stopped here because there has been some excavations, and these excavations could have been done only by one animal. The artfark or ant bear would have made these. And we know that because it's an incredibly, well, it's a dead straight hole. It's been dug around the place, but also look how far, if you come out here, this is how far the sand has been thrown. They're extremely powerful diggers of the Artfark, so we're pretty sure that that's what that was. Now, what he was looking for is difficult to say. There are, of course, lots and lots of termites around at the moment. We followed, we found another two piles like the ones we just showed you. So you could be eating those. But artfark also eat a lot in the way of ants. And like I say, there are hundreds of species of ants around the place. And a lot of them will be in subterranean nests somewhere like this, perhaps in the rootstock of a tree like this. Now, this is a Combretum apiculatum, or red bush willow tree. And lots of these little holes you find heading down into the rootstock of these Combretum apiculatum trees. So perhaps there is a species of ant that likes to live amongst the roots of the red bush willow, and that is exactly what the ant was going at. Let us continue. We're on the crest now, heading north still. Now, Donna in Rhode Island, I'm not entirely sure what a fire ant is. Um, safe to say that we probably get similar species here. We don't get anything, I don't think, called a fire ant specifically. But we get many ants that produce formic acid, which can produce a burning sensation. And we also get many biting ants, red ants, that will bite you. And I'm sure that some of those must be related to what you would term a fire ant, Donna. So a little bit interesting around here is the change in vegetation. When we first came across you, or you first came across us, we were looking at some hyena, and we were quite close to a drainage system, and the vegetation was very different. It was thick. There were different tree species around. Now, we're on to a crest, and in this area where 
you can see these are granit granitic soils, very pale in color, very sandy, not particularly nutrient rich. In this area, on the top of the crests, we always get these marula trees, these huge trees. Iconic African trees that produce a beautiful fruit from which uh, Scott and Nikki have made a number of preserves and jams. Um, no, they are not 95 years old, but they are just very clever in the kitchen. And uh, they've failed so far to share any of these with us, and I'm hoping that they will in the next little while. Marula, of course, is also the fruit supposedly used to make Amarula cream, a very famous liqueur. Now, Cindy, as we walk over this ancient landscape derived of granite underneath the surface of the soil, you want to know if we find naturally occurring gemstones in this particular area. No, Cindy, we don't find gemstones here. I don't think we even find semi-precious stones in this particular area. The only ones that I've seen, of course, or the only sparkly things I've seen, are little bits of quartzite somewhere, and quartzite, of course, is not particularly valuable. It's just straight old silica, which is um, a very common derivation of granite. Right, we're now on what we call the fire break. So you can see it's a bit clearer through here, and the northern boundary into Biffles Hook is just along here. Now, Cindy, of course, South Africa is extremely rich in minerals and precious stones, but not in, particularly in this region. Of course, the most famous deposit of precious stones would be the Kimberley formations of diamonds. That's where so many of the world's diamonds came from. Tremendously conflicted history, that one but that's for another time. Now, the termites have been busy here as well. You can see this is an old piece of elephant dung, deeply ancient, possibly from the Pleistocene era, and it's now being eaten by termites. They've covered it in mud, and what that allows them to do is to live in the shade. Termites very seldom have every, any kind of melanin, especially the harvested termites, and so what they do is that they will build sand over the top and then eat it from within and eventually this will just be a pile of sand with one or two pieces of stick in it. I think this may have been abandoned. Yeah, it has. There we go. Well, this is actually quite interesting. I think this has been abandoned so we can open it up. It's not actually that old. But you can see how bits and pieces of this organic material has been replaced by sand. Isn't that amazing? Now David, you are new to the bush of course, and what you need to do is not eat this. Don't eat this, David. What I'm going to do is let you smell it. Take a deep breath, everybody. Smell that? Mmm. What does it smell like? Not much, he says. If you age elephant dung just right, and I'd say about two weeks is the correct age, it is the most wonderful herby, earthy smell. Fresh, it's a bit strong, but this age, I, if I'm feeling slightly sad, the, a little whiff of this will immediately lift my spirits. So David, next time you reach for the Prozac, rather reach for a piece of elephant dung. It'll make you feel much better. As we're walking along, there's a mound over here. Breeza, you want to know about how on earth these mounds are built and what they are made of. Forktail drongo just exploded from the bush there. I don't know, it must have been hiding. They don't normally sit that close to the ground. Anyway, Breeza, they're actually not made of anything particularly incredible. They're made of uh, saliva and dirt and probably a bit of dung too. So a termite will come, I'll explain exactly how they're made once we get there. Ooh, this might be actually quite a good one. All right, this one is actually still active and there are termites in it now. And I can hear them as I walk along it going that I'll see if I can't move the microphone so you can actually hear them doing it. 
You hear that? That That's the termites bashing their head. It's the termites bashing their heads against the side of the mound. Right, Breeza, what happens is, and it's a wonderful story, and the best time to explain it, of course, is just after the first rains, when the alates are emerging, because that's a kind of real celebration of life in the history of a termite mound. Anyway, when those alates, which are the male and female and winged termites, which a lot of people called flying ants, which are not in fact flying ants, they're flying termites, they come out in great numbers after the rain. And they fly around the place and they land and they flap their little wings together and the female exudes a pheromone, the male will find her, they mate and then they dig a little hole and they go under the ground. And what they do is they dig out a little chamber which will become the female and male, in fact it will become the royal chamber where the female and the male will live for the rest of their lives. She will then grow from roughly this big up to about that big eventually. So almost half a foot long she will be and she will begin to lay eggs. 20,000 of them a day is what she's able to lay when she's at full size. And what happens then is that those workers and soldiers, some of them will be workers, some of them will be soldiers, what the workers will do is start to go around and gather plant material and they'll start to dig under the ground. And where their diggings come, they've obviously got to push the stuff to the surface and they will bring all of their diggings to the top of the surface. They will, with that they will bring water. These mounds you normally go down to the water table and if you find fresh building on them they're always covered in water so they have access to water and then they start to build. And the, it, most of this of course is containing contains tunnels and it's just a kind of a, I guess it's a rearrangement of the soil and obviously like a tip of an iceberg for example this mound extends very far down into the ground. So all of the soil that they've had to remove from within the mound has come out on top here. It's been attached to itself or cemented together with saliva and with dung and that's how it's made. And I mean these particular areas, if I knock on here, David, you can see me knocking here. It's pretty hard, like cement, but these top areas, which have just been built, are much softer. So they will harden as time goes on. And that's how they're built. Breeza, I hope that answers your question. You can feel some heat coming off here. And last time I did this while I was live, I was nipped on the hand by a soldier termite, which was very unkind of him. Anyway, had I not been live, I may have ended him, but I just placed him gently back into his mound. Okay, that's the termite mound. Let us continue on our way. Ah, now this larpa, you, <laughs> you're right there David, this larpa, you're doing some kind of evolution module, I'm not sure from what course you're doing, but maybe tell us, because that would be fascinating, and you want to know if I have ever been to the cradle of humankind, which of course is in the Gauteng region of South Africa, it's a central high felt, very small province, economic hub indeed of the country and possibly even the continent in which Johannesburg, my hometown, lives. Um, yes, I have been to the Cradle of Humankind, Lis Lapa. It's a fascinating place and obviously for those of you who don't know, some of the most ancient hominid and hominin fossils have been found there and the whole tale of our human history, a huge chunk of that tale, a huge chunk of the tale of human evolution has been told because of the fossils found around Sterkfontein, which is the area, the caves, there are underground caves in which a lot of the fossils have been found. The most le recent one, of course, was Homo naledi, an ancient hominid. I've had, don't, I can't remember the exact age of her or where she fits into our evolutionary tree, but she was a, I say she could have been he, there would have been he's and she's, of course, um, she was about, I think, a little bit smaller than me, uh, upright, smaller brain than us, very much sort of along the lines between Australopithecus, which was the first one they found there, I think, and us. 
All right, we're going to continue now down sort of to the western side here and make our way slowly back towards the camp. I mean, we're a long way out from there, but that's our plan for, the, for now. Let's head back to Scott, see what he's doing, and I'll catch up with you a little bit later. Hello and welcome back on board with us. I uh, hope you've been having a good time with James on the bushwalk. I've no doubt that you have. The good news is, is that we did find some tracks of a female leopard, 99% sure it's Karula. And interestingly enough, she headed, the tracks were heading away from the area where we were searching for her yesterday. We, not yesterday, but the day before, we heard her make a kill. It was very thick bush, we couldn't see anything, but we heard this die kill, possibly a steer and buck squealing in distress. And we went back yesterday afternoon to see if we couldn't find where she was with the kill. Got a bit sidetracked because we found tracks of the Inkawuma Pride, which we then tracked out of the property. Anyway, we couldn't work out where she was yesterday, but now her tracks are leading straight out of that area, and they were heading towards this northern boundary of ours. So, just hoping that we might get lucky getting any further sign of her here, or maybe we'll bump into her in the flesh. That'll be even better than having to track her down. So at least now we've got an idea, like I said, of where she's gone, and it, again, lays a good foundation for this afternoon. James Richards, thanks very much for asking about my knee. It's fine, it's just a little bit of a ding there. Nearly ah! got taken out by a branch um, as, as he drove past, but no, nothing serious, just a little, just a little wound. Thank you for your concern. Um, I may have over-dramatized it a little bit last night at the end of the drive. What it was exactly was that the, the window winder had fallen off its little kind of thing that it latches onto, and that little kind of nut sticking out there is what got me. Oh, look at this. We found the latest Sabi Sands dance group, and you don't get to see them performing very often. This is a special one. Look at those dance moves. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And there's Dave, who you'll be a lot of you will be seeing for the first time. Handsome fellow and a great guy to have on the team. I'm sure he's been enjoying his first bushwalk. Good luck, guys. Thanks for the dance routine. <laughs> and maybe they're going to bump into Karula. Did you hear the updates? Karula's tracks were heading north up uh, Gari Cutline towards Buffalo, so about 200 meters south of there is where I saw the last one. So maybe she's lurking amongst you. If you dance enough, I'm sure you'll lure her out. Oh, thank you. Cheers. <laughs> well, that was awesome because we got to see James dancing. A lot of you got to see David for the first time. Uh, the Mystic Boer was nowhere to be seen. There's no surprises there. He disappears like a wolf in the night. And more importantly, they are in that area where maybe, just maybe, they're going to hear some alarm calls, find some further sign of Karula. Or who knows, anything else of interest? My plan from here is to continue along this northern boundary to a large water hole, which seems to be the most active of all the water holes that we get to see. Um, we can only view it from this northern boundary. It's a little bit to the right where we cannot go, but we still had some incredible sightings of animals coming down to drink. A massive herd of zebra was there last time I was there. Water dog, kudu, elephant often go there. So a good place to go and check out. And especially now, not, I mean, today's not the best example, but because it is heating up ever so slightly, getting a little bit warmer, um, that's when the water holes tend to become very active. You know, between kind of 10 and 2 o'clock in the midday heat is when the animals most enjoying quenching their thirst, especially the prey animals, because it's less likely that they're going to get jumped on by lion or leopard in the middle of the day. 
they can see further and they know that the cats are lazy in the midday heat. Richard in Colorado. Uh, you would like to know if this drought is connected to El Nino and yes, 100%. These are the results of the El Nino effect, which has huge raging effects over the whole of Africa at various periods. And basically, I mean, it's, it's a lottery. Either El Nino means it's raining when it's not supposed to be raining, or it's a drought, you know, it's not raining when it's supposed to be raining like here. So some parts of Africa may be getting large amounts of rain. Oh, that's what's happening there. There was a long tail trike alarm calling at this brown snake eagle as it flew off, and even though its name suggests that it hunts snakes predominantly, they will hunt other prey. And for the long-tailed trike that was alarm calling, I guess it looks quite snake-like with its long tail. Let me move forward a bit and you'll be able to show you a view of it. But you'll, oof, it's in very thick bush there. Um, oh, well done, Brian's found another one up ahead. So let's creep up to this one. But who knows, I mean, maybe, just maybe, that snake eagle was trying to hunt a snake, maybe we scared it off. But birds of prey will typically be alarm called at by all manner of little birds like this. Oh, well done, Brian. Oh, this magpie truck's got a sawn off tail. Stumpy. Supposed to be twice as long as that. Great work on camera there. Shame. Everybody must make fun of that one. Let's see if we can't get this bassalier coming in here, Brian. It's always a bit of a gamble, but we're going to go for it. Looks like it's not, it's, it's not going to work out. Although, here it comes. It's going to turn back into an open view for Brian there. There it comes. It's a juvenile bassalier eagle, and you'll notice it's got a much longer tail than an adult. Well, maybe you won't notice, but you sh it's something you should look for. The seasoned ornithologist amongst us will notice that tail is longer than it will be when it's adult. It also doesn't have its adult plumage, which would mean it would be black and white underneath its wings, varying degrees of those two colors depending on whether it's male or female. How awesome is this view? You would have also noticed that it had to flap its wings there a couple of times, and that's because it's still early on in the morning. The hot air thermals aren't as hot as they need to be to allow the battalier to float completely effortlessly, although it seems to be doing a good job at it now. Another characteristic of these birds is how they teeter like this from side to side. And you'll notice those very slight movements, and that is a result of their short tail. They don't have a good rudder like most other eagles do have. And they're... Oh, it's too high above us now for Brian to be able to get to it. Maybe it's... Oh, there we go, it's popped back out for us. But the Latin name, Pterothopius equidatus, describes this bird very well. Be uh, beautiful face, short tail. So that's what their Latin name means. They've got a bright red face when they do have their adult plumage. And what's interesting is that the adult plumage only kicks in at around eight years of age. And I'm sure that's got a lot of you thinking. So eight years to eat, reach adult plumage, and then they can live up to about 50 years, a lot of the raptors. Another thing that's interesting with them is the or origination of their name. The battalier comes from a French word, pastel. And that's because of this teetering from side to side that we've been noticing as it's flying. Just as a acrobat or a trapeze artist would teeter from side to side as he performs on the tightrope, and that is exactly what a bar style is. It's an acrobat or a trapeze artist in French, I'm told. If there are any French people watching, you can confirm that for us if you like. You could also post us some croissants. That would be great. Croissants out here are good, but not quite as good as the French ones. Beautiful. Hmm. 
Kenny Pine. Good morning and good to know you're watching again. Um, you'd like to know how far is the Nile from where we are here? And you don't have to apologize for your ignorance because I am going to have to now in return apologize for my ignorance because I also am not geographically certain of how far away it is. Um, but the source of the Nile, is it not in Uganda? Maybe? Possibly, which would make it at about 4,000, 5,000 kilometers away, 3,000 odd miles. I'm, I'm wrong, it's 11,000 kilometers away, and I'm not even sure where the source of the Nile is, but I'm sure somebody is going to be able to provide us with that little nuggets of information. I think it's somewhere in Central Africa. But apologies, Penny, we are equally not sound geographically. And uh, Penny, why exactly would you like to know where the Nile is with relation to the Kruger? That is the question I have for you. What has that got to do with the price of chicken milk? We know it's 11,000 kilometers away, which means that is far. I mean, the equator is probably, <coughs> as the crow flies, only about 5,000 kilometers from where we are here. So the fact that it's 11,000 kilometers away makes me think that, yeah, I wonder. You see the source of the Nile, the, the end of the Nile, obviously those are going to be two very different points. I'm told Nikki in the final control room is doing some research, so we will get back to you as soon as we know a little bit more about the Nile River. And while we scratch our heads and ponder about that, we're going to send you back to James. Now, of course, not the first time we've seen this little fellow. In fact, I mentioned him at the beginning of the drive, a walk, this walk, whatever safari we're doing at the moment. Can't remember. And it is a little mantis, tiny little mantis, that lives on a specific plant species called Waltheria. And it is specifically designed to be camouflaged so that it looks exactly like the Waltheria flower. Isn't that brilliant? And it's the second one we found. I say we, I mean Steph has found. And what you can also see on the back here is these long antenna constantly vibrating in the air, picking up signals, smells, vibrations of sound and movement. And what this mantis is waiting for, of course, is an insect to come and try and pollinate one of these flowers. And that insect is going to find that the mantis extends these incredibly powerful front legs with their claws on them and it will then find itself shortly in her mouth. Now watch her raise up her defensive posture. Isn't that amazing? And she really does have the look of a sort of a look of evil about her. I'll try and get her to look at the camera. Looks like her eyes are on the end of these two sort of white cones. Isn't she amazing? It's absolutely no wonder to me at all that most of the aliens you see on these films have been modelled on some kind of insect, which creates, of course, great terror for most people. And the last thing I want you to see on him, her, is this white patch on her abdomen. And that's, that's basically what makes it spottable on these Waltheria plants. Cool, huh?
Now, sadly, of course, as with so many of the invertebrates, I mean, I've called this a mantis. A mantis is an entire order of animals. And I mean, to just give you the same perspective uh, for the mammals, if I was to say an order of mammals, I would mean perhaps the artiodactyla, so the even-toed ungulates. That means every single mammal has got a cloven hoof. That's, that's the size of the taxon that into which this mantis falls. So, I mean, there are thousands of species of these little things, and I don't know what this one's called. Let's head across to Scott. He is with an artiodactyla, the tallest one that we have. OK, copy, thanks. Apologies, my earpiece is playing up again. It's quite bizarre. I mean, it's not like I'm jumping around in this seat, but it appears to just be coming in and out of action. Um, good to have you back, and we're in luck. As you can see, Sydney's waterhole is providing the goods. Two of the tallest and one of the shortest of the herbivores. Well, you yeah, know, the, the giraffe are the tallest. That's, the, that's a fact that I guess the What's our, there's not many other kind of herbivores that are much shorter than it that I can think of. So it will certainly be enjoying the safety and security knowing that these giraffe have got good lookout points all the way up there to make sure no predators are approaching. They're actually wonderful, wonderful animals with regards to helping us find predators because if you come around a corner and you see giraffes staring very intently in one direction, very often they can be looking at an animal like a leopard or a cheetah, and they'll even allow animals like leopard and cheetah to walk meters past them. They're not scared of them at all. They know that they don't pose a threat to them. Lion, a little bit different, but even that, even that they'll stare at them from a long distance off. A wonderful scene here. Got some rattling cesticulars calling, sweet, sweet, doop, 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 all around us. Having a serious commotion. Well, there's good news for Again, just general prospects. And a cheetah has been found not too far east of our eastern boundary, our kind of southeastern corner of Juma. And on a cool day like this, it could well move a large distance and maybe grace us with its presence this afternoon. And there's been a lot of cheetah sightings frequently. So whether it's just luck that people have been finding them, or whether there's a slight influx of them into the area because it's drier and more open than normal. Maybe they're feeling more comfortable and safe here. I'm not sure. But there have been quite a few cheetah sightings recently. Only one with us, sadly. But as long as they're in the area, our chances are going to be good. I'd love to get you closer to them, but like I've said earlier, they are north of our northern boundary, so this is as far as we can go. But it's quite nice actually being forced to sit on this slightly elevated area. We've got a bit of a vista. It gives you kind of a different perspective to how we often view animals, and that's up close and personal. Look at that long tail, the perfect fly swisher. The grey go away bird in the foreground there. Just landed in a guari bush. Looking for breakfast. Hello to Africa on YouTube. 
And you would like to know how strong is a giraffe's neck? And I don't know how exactly, I mean, it's very strong is the only way that I can think of answering that question. Um, I can't give you like a, a, anything to relate to really. Um, I'm trying to think as best as I can as to what could, like I say, relate to a giraffe's neck strength too, but nothing's, nothing's working out in this little head of mine. Um, but incredibly strong. I mean, I've got a lot of muscles around those vertebrae to hold the head up. I mean, it's fairly thick at the base. It does thin out towards the top, but what's important to understand is that giraffes use those necks of them as their main weapon. It's a major tool that these animals use for fighting. Interestingly, it's a weapon that's only used really amongst themselves, an intraspecies combat tool, as opposed to one that they would ward off lions with. They use their hooves and their massive legs to kick out at lions and um, there's an awesome little clip that I just have to show you here that my mom sent to me last night. Check this out. Um, where are we going? Oh, not that one. Let's see if okay, hold on a second. I'm just getting it ready. Oh, I can't let you watch yet until I've got it ready. Hehe, <laughs> but this is going to be cool. So, speaking of giraffe and weapons. Oh, sorry, Brian. Ah, oh, are we ready? Yep, how's the glare? Not too good, eh? Should be okay. Cool. Patao! So, imagine seeing that! And here comes the slow mo. Fascinating that the lion even attempted this stunt. And watch now, I mean, whether it's luck, whether it's just a stray hoof, watch the back right hoof here. Is it the back right hoof that lands on the lion? But oh, ow! Sorry, but get out of my way. I don't want to be your breakfast. So, um, that's an example of how giraffes can use their hooves as weapons, but Africa, they will use their necks to fight. And they whip, they kind of stand like this to one another, and if those are their necks, they just swing in and hit either the, the, the bodies of their giraffe, or even sometimes they can hit the head and deliver knockout blows. Imagine seeing a giraffe Doish, capsizing. It can happen. It does happen um, when they're having their boxing matches. So yes, I guess it's a very strong neck. It's not flimsy. And like I said, I wish I could give you some relation or you know, tell you how much they could lift with their neck or anything like that, but nothing's coming to mind. was that footage Woof. that come that cameraman must have been doing cartwheels after that happened because I mean who would have expected the lioness to attempt that stunt like I said I mean just absolutely cool and something else that's uh, important to remember here is that they are just so tough these wild animals I mean to be knocked off a giraffe like that as it runs past and then stood on. I mean, that giraffe probably weighed at least 250 kilos. It wasn't a fully grown giraffe, but it was huge. And it got that full hoof, kata, into the ribs. And the lion probably got up, shook its head and carried on going. And it's something now that we need to continue to remind ourselves is that we as humans have become fairly weak and pathetic for a long, for a long list of reasons with regards to strength, speed, agility, um, 
whereas wild animals have remained with their, their body and their physique and their senses being very, very strong and very honed and much better than ours as a general rule. Yet our brain power has allow, allowed us, our bodies and our senses to become lazy in a way because we don't need them anymore. Our brain power has allowed us to make life easy for ourselves, I guess. So we're not nearly as tough and or strong as those animals. You can put a hundred pound human against a hundred pound animal of any description. And 99% of the time that wild animal will outpower the human. Whether it's in a tug of war or a running race, most things are gonna outcompete us. Stranger, you've mentioned that the giraffe looked a little bit kind of uncoordinated, out of control. Um, I agree with you, and that's why I said I'm not sure whether it was default that that hoof landed perfectly in the ribs or, you know, whether it was incredible skill that allowed that to happen. I'm thinking uh, that it was just luck. But regardless of luck and whether those hooves are controlled or not, they are something that you don't want to get tangled between. So even if they're just flaying around wildly, it's going to make lions think twice. And I'm sure that there have been several occasions where lions have been kicked instantaneously to death. Putoof, one hoof to the head, sleep tight, end of the game. I'm certain that's happened. I haven't heard of any documented cases, but that's not to say that it hasn't happened. I'm confident it would have. I've heard of a male leopard, the Campan male leopard, who's no longer around, but he was a monster. He used to occur south of where we are. I used to see him when I started my career in the Sabi Sands. He was apparently chasing a big zebra and he got caught one in the forehead and was unconscious, sleeping. But he woke up and he wasn't kicked to death. Kentucky, the average stride of a giraffe. I'm guessing you're meaning in full gallop. Um, I would say possibly it would be traveling as much as maybe 15 meters, 10 to 15 meters in the air before its hooves touch the ground. It will be covering, its gait will be very long when it's at full gallop. I mentioned the other day that I think cheetah will only touch the ground when they're at full speed every 25 meters. That is horrifying. Let me show you what that means. So, whoa. you won't be able to hear me very clearly anymore, but this should solve the problem. Hello, hello, welcome back. So. We start here, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Let's stop at twenty. That's a long way. Now, I'm not going to do a full sprint, but I'm going to, as far as I could there, one, two, three, four. So I only got four meters. Um, at a big jump. I'm happy for you guys to double check me on the distance that Cheetah will spend in the air when at full speed. Somebody behind us here. The main man here, Juma, who does a lot of the camp management stuff. Mr. Jim Reeves. So I'll get out of his way shortly. This is the main access road to Juma. So I mean, imagine. I mean, that, that cheetah, obviously it's flying. It's literally flying. It's, mo it's moving 
at about around 60 miles an hour, slightly upwards of that, possibly. I've never personally clocked one. <laughs> but they're incredibly quick, and at that speed, their feet are only touching the ground in massive, massive gaps. focus from looking for Karula, a female leopard, to see if there's any sign of her daughter called Shadow. And this is the kind of area where we may find some sign of her. So wish us luck and we're going to send you over to James, who's still strolling around the wilderness. Three. Now, we are standing underneath a Balanites Mogami tree or torchwood tree. Now, the torchwood is apparently supposed to be called a torchwood because of the flammable properties of the oil found within the fruit or the seed. Well, I can tell you for free that uh, flammability is not something that I've discovered here. Here is a very pretty pink flame maker. Very pretty, David. Thank you for that. And you will see that the only thing I'm going to burn here are my fingers in the wind. I don't know why it's, I've tried to derive a flame from this fruit a few times. So in the background you may hear some hacking and sawing noises. And that is Steph trying desperately to cut through a seed to see if there's some oil. Now I'll just give you an idea of how hard these seeds are. Here is a, a very powerful knife, of course, and I'll just shave off a few pieces of this thing. And if you are a young viewer, please don't play with knives, or indeed flames in the wilderness. And you can see there a really kind of woody outside to the seed. And the fruits, of course, are devoured by things like squirrels, but the seeds themselves are massively hard. And I'm just going to see if we can't find some kind of... Oh, here we go. We have some luck. Steph, Steph has managed to open up one of the fruits. Uh, but inside it, a grub has clearly fed on what is very nutritious fatty oil. But that's what it looks like. Isn't that amazing? I don't think I'm going to burn the back end of that grub. I think that would be unkind. But possibly in that cavity is where the oil exists. It smells like dried apricots, which of course are not a food source. Dried apricots are a bad culinary joke. Right, let's put him back in there and we'll let him go. Uh, unless of course you're having trouble in the bowels, in which case a dried apricot is probably quite a good thing for you. That's more prunes though, I think, David. Okay, on we go. Oh, let me just show you a whole fruit quickly. This is what a whole fruit looks like. We can break this. Well, let me get me, me knife out again. Me great Excalibur. Of course, all danger, all, all, all bushmen, you know, who live in the dangerous wilds like I do, must carry some kind of vicious knife to defend oneself against the elements, the animals. buffalo. We're not too far from where those lions were. Amazing. You can hear in the distance the sound of southern boo-boo. There is other birds and then suddenly blah, 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 from a buffalo. But just listen while I cut this open. But that's what the fruit looks like. And it has a very pleasant smell. Like I say, well, pleasantish. Dried apricots, of course, are absolutely disgusting in my opinion, but that's what that smells like. Okay. Right. What we're going to do is move very slowly up onto the crest here and then move along the crest. What I don't want to do is to run into some buffalo being harassed by those lions. 
that would be a silly thing to invite upon oneself. And so we'll just move along there and see if we can't look down into the valley from the top of the crest. It is quite thick though, so we're going to be quite careful about it. David, let us get on. I'm just going to check the wind as well. That could have been two buffalo just having a little bit of a fight with each other. It could also have been um, one of those sort of small fragmented herds that's been ru running around the place of late and they're just sort of having a, a belch at each other. The wind is good for us. We're walking straight into the wind, so that's a good thing. And by wind, I mean very gentle zephyr. So I think we'll just meander slowly up onto the crest here and then head down to the south. <laughs> now, we have a question from a viewer called Draw. Now, Draw, you are in Berlin, as far as I understand it. I'm assuming that's Berlin, Germany. I don't know of any others. Draw, watch out here. You want to know about um, elephant graveyards and if there is one anywhere, anywhere around here. Draw, along with many, many misconceptions created by the Lion King, wonderful story, biological fallacy, one of those misconceptions and fallacies is that elephants go to a graveyard to die. There is no such thing as an elephant graveyard. I'm not entirely sure where that came from because I don't think it was born in the Lion King. Anyway, no such thing. Elephants, I think the legend might come from the fact that elephants, you often don't find their bones around. And I think people are confused by that because obviously elephants are enormous. So if they're dying, every so often surely their bones must be around the place and why don't we see them and therefore they must be going somewhere special to die but draw what happens is that elephants elephants um, will normally when they die of course